but it's something that you find in the film Halloween, which, if you haven't seen it or if you haven't seen it in a long time, he does this amazing and unexpected ability, uh, um, the film talking about the cinematographer, of uh, uh, essentially mm, creating a, a scary horror situation, and of course, you know, like a, a sort of a, also horrific things happen in this film without showing them which is one of the most uh, refined and, and quite uh, unique characteristics of filmmakers, uh, particularly uh, since uh, the genre of the film itself, which is a slasher movie, tends to show everything there, that put everything on your face. Um, very often, instead, um, uh, s very few, we could say the director, cinematographer, but very often use the, the opposite kind of uh, um, process, the, the opposite kind of um, solution, which is a narrative and a visual solution where you leave something off screen, outside the boundaries of the screen, to essentially portray that space, but portray, by, uh, it's a way of portraying it indirectly, vic uh, vicariously. Um, it's this sort of technique, if you want, it goes under different names, but one way of uh, sort of defining that kind of space is the, the term implied space. So it's a space that is suggested to us through uh, sounds, through characters looking off screen, through reactions to something that is supposed to be there, and of course maybe was not, it's just the actors that are uh, trained to pretend that they're seeing something there, and therefore sometimes also our minds believe that action that we never saw as something that we saw in the film. Actually, we implied it too. We just never, um, uh, after a while, you know, you don't, two, three weeks pass or, or even longer time, you don't remember exactly what you saw or what you didn't see, but you have memories of those things. This is a, a very first basic example, which would be, um, the main reason for this one was actually to save money. To, uh, to um, This was a low-budget film by Frank Borzegi where um, he had this very important thing where somebody's supposed to uh, get off the train at the train station. It's a very, um, uh, it would be a very important turning point in the story, in the narrative of the film. Um, and yet, of course, you know, for budget reasons, but also for narrative reasons, we do not see the train. We do not see if that person, you know, is getting off the train. It's all about the suspense, the tension that is created by showing um, uh, the actor that is on screen waiting for him. So the implied space here. It's created by the shadows, it's created by the smoke, their faces, so elements of the mise-en-scene turning, and then the disappointment of the guys there. Clearly, as I said, was done because this was a low-budget production, but it had a very specific purpose, which was the one of also projecting the tension towards the bound, outside the boundaries of the screen. So if we call this off-screen space, we have different areas. Of course, if you have a shot, this is just one of the many possible examples from uh, Clockwork Orange. Uh, you have four spaces, which are four areas of screen, one on the left, one on the right, and then, of course, above and below. Um, and then you have another two, which would be one uh, area would be behind the last thing that you see there, and it would be the wall in front of us, and then there's also behind us, meaning behind the, uh, behind the camera. Now, um, if you consider all these spaces and you put something that um, is actually uh, is sort of like a actively important in the narrative, uh, outside the boundaries of the screen, so in one of those six areas, you have what they call the active off-screen space, which means that it's narratively important. Uh, a projection of what I just saw you, uh, what I just show, uh, showed you, uh, it would be this clip where, this is the, the opening of this film, where uh, we hear a noise and you'll see how the tension is projected towards what exactly they're keeping away from us. <laughs> So imagine that this film had started instead with, I don't know, a serial killer strangling somebody, and then we go downstairs, we hear the noise. It would have been a different kind of uh, opening. I mean, you wouldn't have had the grabber kind of uh, uh, opening that usually uh, it's called like that because it grabs your attention. Um, if uh, uh, we move to something more recent, and uh, you know, Country for Old Men would be an example. If you've seen the film, just out of curiosity, how many of you have seen the film? 
Good. If you haven't seen the film, this is a, that's a complicated story, but essentially there's a guy behind that door with a very ba bad haircut who became famous for that, <laughs> who's like with a hair compressor that is about to, I mean, it's about, it kills people on the whims of a, actually the flip of a coin. And so this guy knows that he's after him. Um, he even has a tracking device that starts beeping when the guy gets closer. So we don't know if that um, crazy guy is right there, if it's somebody else. We suspect it because the tracking device, even if it's not precise, tells us. But you see how if we moved at this point, and usually in a drama or a comedy, we would, you know, on the other side of the, of, of the door, it wouldn't be as suspenseful as it is right now because we are with him in the uncertainty. The basic rule that works with everything, unfortunately also with politics, is that we, what you don't see is really scary. What you don't see and they just define for you, describe for you, or they let your imagination define becomes the scariest possible thing. Um, that's why uh, there are so many films that instead if you, if you uh, show something on screen, it might be um, appealing to some uh, people in the audience, and especially there's a whole genre, the splatter kind of uh, um, cinema, the, the gory one that relies on that. But in terms of narrative, it's much more effective and it's much more scary to create a situation like that. Um, how many people have seen Rosemary's Baby by Roman Polanski? Oh, so it's a Halloween crowd, good. Um, this film, it's the story, and I'm not spoiling anything, maybe not, but um, it's the story of this woman who for 90% of the film thinks that she's pregnant with the son of the Antichrist, meaning that for 90% of the film, we do not know if she's right, it's true, this is the type of film that presumes that supernatural uh, situation and so forth, or if she's just being paranoid. She is taking medication, she's pregnant, she's like going through a difficult phase, and, and so she feels a little bit attacked by everybody around her. So this film keeps the very same concern that of the film that you see there in the title, the baby, this monster. Will it be a monster? Will it be a regular baby? Is she the crazy one there? For the entire film off screen, first of all, because it's inside a part of the mise en scene, meaning it's, uh, the baby is supposed to be um, in her own body. Uh, we have many moments where the, the, the film shows stresses that like that. And also because at the very end of the film, and here it's a, it is a little bit of a spoiler, but uh, bear with me. Uh, at the very end of the film, well, we are supposed to see this baby and whether or not it's really a monster or she realizes that she was crazy, they will never show the baby. Because if they show the baby, this is a film from 1968, but even if it were of t t from 2007, just to throw in another uh, year, like just a few years ago, the conventions of horror cinema changed so quickly that we would be laughing because what could it be? Uh, an ugly mini monster, right? That's there with uh, ugly eyes and ugly face. Instead, in that scene, in the final scene, it's much more powerful to see the mother uncovering, uh, actually moving uh, um, a little bit of curtains at the veil and looking inside this uh, cradle and just seeing her expression, the expression on her face. That's the real scare at that point, you know, the, the, the fact that she's horrified and we don't, still don't see, you know, what, uh, what she's seeing there, but apparently something so scary and the shock, of course, is uh, um, uh, portrayed through this, um, what they call a um, reaction shot. I mean, it's the reaction of a character to something that is not shown to us, is, is uh, off screen. That is quite powerful. Uh, Roman Polaski used that uh, quite extensively in his films. Here's an example uh, where he himself explained. Um, actually, no, this is an example where um, uh, the cinematographer of the film explained how Roman Polaski wanted to use the off screen space. This is the, the earlier in the film, by the way. So it's uh, we're, we don't know if all the neighbors are really these mean, evil people that want to uh, do something bad to her. So we're still doubting with her. And so this woman find out, finds out that she's pregnant and she's just saying, like, we're going to find the best doctor for you. And so we don't know if she's going to really do it or if she's going to find a way to harm her or to do something bad to her. So we want to know what she's going to say to this doctor. There's a shot in Rosemary's Baby. Says, where's the telephone? And Mia says, in the bedroom. And Ruth says, oh, good. And she exits. Roman says, Billy, can you give me a POV of, uh, of Ruth? And I got him framed perfectly. Beautifully see her on the phone talking. I say, okay, Roman, we're ready. And he comes over, he looks, he says, no, 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 Billy, no, 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 Billy, move, 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 move the left, move the left, and kindly move. And I look through and I see just the and back. 
of Ruth Gordon seated on the bed. And he can't see her face when she was talking. I said, but you can't see her. He says, exactly. I said, oh, okay. So now we go to the theater. And 800 people in the theater all go, <laughs> see around the door jam. That's Grumman Poems. And it really is a, a clever idea because even if you sometimes you're not conscious that when you get to that scene, you actually want to hear what she's saying. So even the idea of um, psychologically moving like that is because you want to see her lips, you want to see her facial expression, because you want to know more about mm, who these characters are. Films that keep you for the entire, mm, for most of the, the film with one character who's, let's say, paranoid or is like a, uh, unsure about the other characters there, makes you not only uh, share the feelings with the, the character, but also share the same fears, including the fears for the off-screen space. Um, this has been used in so many ways, including, and I think this is one of the most interesting aspects for me, but we'll, we'll take a look at a prototype first and then at uh, uh, modification, but like uh, from the same film I showed you before, The Spiral Staircase, you have this scene where the murder actually of this woman is taking place on screen, and yet something happens in the, in the light, so the light changes, which makes exactly the space that we're seeing now, um, uh, puts that space off screen, and therefore, we could say it's a change in the mise-en-scene, so a change in the lighting, a change, of, it could also be, let's say, for example, somebody passing in front of the camera and obstructing the view. It's that kind of movement or change in the mise-en-scene that puts something that is on screen off screen. Spielberg did exactly the same thing in a slightly um, different way with mm, camera movements and a combination of interaction between the camera and the mise-en-scene in Minority Report in the scene where uh, this detective that you see there played by Tom Cruise is running away with this uh, psychic who can foresee things. What's interesting in this clip is that uh, the cops are after them and if uh, it's the film is set in the future, the cops can read uh, the iris of people's eyes to identify them. Um, and so this is a moment where they have to run away um, and she essentially foresees a change in the mise-en-scene that will put them off screen. Can you see the umbrella? Take it. Take it! A man in a blue suit. He drops his briefcase. You see a woman in a brown dress. She knows your face. Turn in here. Let's go. Wait. No, we can't stop here. You see the balloon man. Wait. Wait. What are we waiting for? Wait. 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 So yeah, it's basically the same principle, just as a movement of somebody, um, in the case also of an object, the balloons, um, that obstructs our view. So it's a change in the mise-en-scene that puts the characters off screen, in this case, to the view of the, of the policeman there. Uh, this has been used so many times with comedy effects, dramatic effects. Um, actually, let me show you an example of something. Um, well, this is, might be a silly example, but I guess it's Halloween, we can show it. Um, it's... Um, um, from uh, um, Austin Bowers. Oh, that'll be Basil Exposition. Oh, ignore it, Austin. Come back to bed. Judy Coles, baby. Hello, Austin. Oh, I, I hope I'm not interrupting your honeymoon. No, not at all, Basil. Did you get that fruit basket I sent you? Yes, we did, Basil, but you sent too much. I'm going to have to send some to my mother. <laughs> Oh, don't forget these. Oh, thanks. <laughs> 
There you go. Did you get my other gift? We did. Yes, Basil. Nice rack. But who in the world gave us this drawing? Bizarre. <laughs> so they go on for quite a while like that. Dr. has escaped in his rocket, which has disappeared from our tracking system. Oh, dear. Hold on. Copy. Oh, yes, please. Okay, thank you. Oh, and Vanessa, by the way, you have been made a full agent. Oh, that's fantastic, Basil. Thanks. Milk? Yes, please. Count Austin, Her Majesty the Queen informs me that you are to be knighted. Very sh And so on. It's going to take on for quite a while. <laughs> but um, this is an example. The ex uh, examples that I showed you are like all examples of this... Um, uh, ability actually of using the off-screen space, so giving us so much information that we create that space. Because uh, beside what's disappearing <laughs> right now, you know, in front of you, but there are all the other examples show something that was happening off-screen, and so that never happened there. Of course, it's all in the ability of the reaction shots of the actors of um, uh, sometimes camera movements that exclude something. And tonight we have a master of that uh, kind of uh, technique, among many others, uh, which I'm briefly uh, going to introduce, as uh, you already know. Um, he doesn't need any introduction, but um, uh, we're talking about an uh, excellent uh, cinematographer, one of the most prolific in the industry, who um, received uh, um, so many accolades, so many, uh, um, it's a cult, basically, a kind of uh, cinematographer who everybody loves and knows very well. And it's, uh, uh, he worked with, uh, you name it, uh, so many directors, with John Carpenter, with Robert Zemeckis, with Steven Spielberg. And uh, it's always like praised for being a great master of camera movements, and in my opinion, and that's what I'm going to ask him tonight, is also a great master of, of light, in the sense that I think it, I see his films and I see some sort of a, a painter of light uh, when I'm in the certain choices that he makes, particularly in the film we're going to watch tonight. Um, uh, was voted one of Kodak's best cinematographers of all times, and so it is really my pleasure and my honor to introduce cinematographer Dean Candy, who came all the way here. We can sit there. Now, can you hear yes. me? So let's sit there, and I'm gonna. Um, hopefully, this will work as a remote control. Um, the first thing that I want to show you, please, can you, if you don't mind sitting there, so I might run to the computer in case uh, doesn't work. But. Um, if you take a look, just to give an introduction to him, and then we'll stop. This is his IMDb page. <laughs> Makes it easy for me, right? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm dizzy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am too. It makes it very easy for me to introduce you because, like, it's clearly uh, the evidence is clearly there of all the many worst collaborations that, uh, and, um, and in different capacities actually um, that uh, Dean Conde actually uh, worked in. Um, First question would be how do you how did you do it, which is uh, probably uh, too generic. So I will start simply by uh, what do you like about your job? What's the thing that still thrills you when you go uh, on set? Well, um, when I was a kid, twelve years old or so, uh, we would go to the movies, and um, on Saturdays there was the kids matinee, yeah. these great films, uh, kids films and 20 cartoons, by the way. Um, and I became enamored with the idea that the guys making these movies uh, could take us on journeys to places we can't go in real life. That's what intrigued me about film. Um, and so when I, um, I went to UCLA Film School, because I had decided for sure that's what I wanted to do, and um, then started working in low-budget movies. But uh, I was always intrigued by the idea of films that could take us on this journey. And a lot of, a lot of my films, I've been very fortunate to, um, to do that. You know, to, I mean, the world of animation with Roger Rabbit, um, dinosaurs with Jurassic Park, um, all of these places you can't go in real life. There no, there are no dinosaurs. I hate to disillusion you, <laughs> but um, so uh, a lot of the films I have worked on have followed that kind of idea of uh, um, 
you know, and, and not always the fantastic world, you know, like superheroes and stuff now, but uh, things that could be that we would enjoy seeing, the return of dinosaurs, um, animated characters, and so forth. So I think that's, that's probably um, what has intrigued me about films and has sort of guided my choices. And because um, I was reading that you grew up in Alhambra, and I guess when you grew up, there were, I mean, local movie theaters, and so you started watching this film. What what was the first time, or what uh, got you the idea of uh, actually? When did you pay uh, attention for the first time to the f work of cinematography in a film? Because what you said uh, is something I can totally understand and share as a person moviegoer, right? But it took me quite a while to pay attention to the editing and to all the aspects of making. So what kind of uh, caught your attention in terms of uh, cinematography? Well, um, I was uh, w one of the first films I remember as a kid was Disney's Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, and um, it was extremely well done. Unlike a lot of other fantasy films of the period, uh, they spent a lot of time, effort, money um, to do it well, and I appreciated that. I think, and uh, one of my first um, ideas was that I wanted to be a production designer to um, create these worlds that, um, you know, we, we visited. But um, it wasn't too much into film school that I realized cinematography were, uh, was the, the aspect of it that was dynamically involved with creating the illusion. Um, it was all about where does the camera go and what is the lighting like and, and how do you take the audience on the journey because we are as cinematographers, the eyes of uh, the audience. And, uh, you know, I, I was always intrigued by the fact that here, here we are sitting in a room, bunch of chairs, bunch of people, staring at a blank white wall. There's nothing there. But when the projector goes on, they project colored moving shadows on that wall, and they suck us in. We become uh, on, we, we're on the journey with these characters that hopefully we like or hate in a world that is fascinating to us. Um, and cinematography, to me, was the, w was the force that moved us through that world, gave us the vision. So uh, I, I became completely uh, intrigued and, and interested in the cinematography aspect of it. One of the things that I want to mention, because there are many um, students here or members of the community that the work or the water work in the, uh, eventually in the film industry, one of the things that you did is, which also I think is quite creative, is that besides going to the film school, to, to the film school, to finding out actually what you wanted to do and and, and switching and switching moving towards uh, cinematography, you also had this brilliant idea at some point of packing everything into a van and just uh, offer yourself essentially like a, a movable production studio to um, different producers or different uh, people that might be interested in making a film. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that idea, how it worked out? Well, I had uh, been working uh, various jobs in the industry. I would take any job I could get, which is the advice I always give people. Take any job you can get. So I worked a little bit as an editor. Uh, my, my first couple of jobs were makeup um, and, um, of course, uh, electrical and, and grip, um, so that I was dynamically involved with, with the process. <coughs> but I was always uh, working on these low-budget films sort of dismayed by the fact that there was never enough of the right equipment. Um, the budget always meant you had to go to a rental house that had stuff that barely worked, not enough of it. Um, so I, I decided I would um, make myself desirable because I could present a whole package of equipment. So in my garage and in my driveway, uh, with the help of a couple of friends, I took a, a van, I added extra doors to both sides, I compartmentalized it, I put sliders so that we could stack lights on them and, and slide them in like drawers. So I made this, this uh, device, the movie van, Clever title, huh? <laughs> My friend thought that up. Wish I could take credit. Um, so we we uh, we built this movie van that had um, 
three cameras, three Aeroflex 2Cs, um, lighting equipment, grip equipment, everything um, needed to do a better job. And um, by offering that along with my services and a, a core crew, um, we were somehow appealing, and um, which gave me the opportunity to work on on uh, films, but also to experiment and and you know improve my craft, and uh, so it it became a package that uh, you know made made me and the, some of the crew guys um, a little more desirable. Um, and then after that, and after a series of films actually that you made. Uh, um, came uh, uh, what was supposed to be a low-budget movie that nobody would care about, according to some of the information that I read, uh, which was Halloween in 1978, uh, which is a film that um, today I was just reading. It's uh, basically, th at the time, it was one of the most successful films in the box office. It made $70 million, and the equivalent of today is $300 million. Uh, totally unexpected, and it's a quite innovative camera. Uh, camera. It's quite innovative film that uses so many techniques. So, was it? Do you find that to be the culmination of your work that you studied with the van, or, or just something that happened by chance? And and, and you. Well, I think uh, I had done about a dozen low-budget movies um, before Halloween. Uh, they were action films. They were films that I describe as girls in bikinis with machine guns, and then something blows up. <laughs> so um, I was a little bit of, uh, kind of frustrated by the fact that so many of the directors weren't interested as I was in trying to tell the story with the camera and, and involve the audience. And uh, they, they tended to think of the camera as a device for recording actors talking and then something blows up, and <clears throat> so I, I you know, I used those uh, those films to sort of experiment, and I would try to talk a director into a more interesting shot or whatever. Sometimes I could do it, sometimes I could make mistakes and nobody noticed. Um, but after about mm, 15 or so of these films, there was a woman who had been the script supervisor on. Um, several of those films, and, and she had, um, I, from what I could tell, perceptions about filmmaking that were more than just m making notes and, and doing her job. Um, and we would discuss reasons for shots and how to improve them. And, and then one day I got a phone call on it from her. Um, this was Deborah Hill. And uh, she said, hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm working with this guy. He's made like one or so films before. But um, I think the two of you would be a good team. I'd like you to come and meet John Carpenter. So uh, I said, oh, fine. <clears throat> and uh, so I met John, and they, they described the film. They were going to make a, a film about babysitters on Halloween um, with a guy chasing him with a knife. Um, and I thought, oh, well, that's interesting, because that was not a typical film for the time. Um, there were no horror films, slasher films, you know, there were minor things, Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but, but it, was a, um, it, w it was an interesting opportunity because um, it, it was innovative in its subject matter. Um, John wanted to do something very stylish with it. Um, he he uh, wanted it to be a film um, wisely about ordinary girls uh, caught in a situation so that uh, if we felt empathy for them, we would be involved in it. Um, and he wanted the, uh, the, the menace to be sort of a, a faceless um, evil. So there were no personalities connecting them. And um, I thought that was um, actually a really good idea. And um, so we went off on this uh, journey together using um, you know, our, all of our real interest in doing a, a, um, a visual film. And um, as a result, um, you know, it came out. And um, 
the first week, a few people showed up, and everyone said, oh, I guess, guess we failed. We should have used blood, because we didn't use any blood. We didn't use any, you know, graphic violence. And um, so they, they said, well, it's, it was a nice attempt. Well, the second week, more people showed up. And then the third week, more and more people showed up. And suddenly, it became the film you had to go see, because it was different and innovative subject matter, and um, interestingly told in a, in a very visual way. Um, and so it became the hit. The, it was, um, for a long time, and, and I, I still think, um, it was the largest grossing independent film ever a dollar in for a dollar out. It cost us about $280,000. I say us, it was another guy's money, fortunately, or sadly. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's grossed, as you say, you, you had 70? Yeah, the 70. $70 million, you know. So uh, when you figure that, uh, you know, this guy put up, let's say, 300000 and has made $48 million, um, as his share of it, it's not a bad investment. Um, it, uh, related to what you were saying, um, uh, I think it's interesting. I have also a clip uh, um, about how you, both in terms of camera movements and in terms of choices, you know, framing, you did exactly with the camera what you were saying um, in terms of like uh, not showing blood, not showing violence, no, but keeping it out. It's, it's like a tour de force. It's such a uh, beautiful way of keeping all these things outside. It, it, my question is like, is something that you come up with, you discuss with Carpenter, or um, did he let you relatively free to, you know, to, to, to experiment? Because these are many great ideas, there are many great ideas in this film, and they'll see it in a few minutes, but I was impressed. I hadn't seen it like in, in probably f five years, and watching it again, I was like uh, blown away by that. So it's something that, yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, it's, it, it's easy to, uh, in retrospect, look at a at a, an early film and say, "Oh, yeah, I've seen a lot like those." You know, like Jurassic Park. Um, it was the very first film that ever used photorealistic creatures made in a computer. Now, and it's easy to forget that because now you see every how many Jurassic Parks have there been, but also every um, you know superhero movie or whatever, work done in the computer that looks amazing. Well, at the time, nobody had made a, compu a computerized um, realistic creature. So um, I think it's, it's easy to look back and say, oh yeah, Jurassic Park, that was one of those dinosaur movies, um, when in fact it was the first. Um, well, the same with Halloween. Um, it's easy to look back and say, oh yeah, it's one of those horror movies from the old days. Um, but, um, you know, at the time, we, we really were invested in trying to do a film that was uh, different, innovative, um, very consciously well made. Um, the aspect ratio, the, the anamorphic uh, ratio 2.40, oh, I think it was at that time. Um, was uh, something that John and I both said, well, that's, you know, something that's always been for like big extravaganza films and westerns and um, nobody had used it for so-called intimate film. Yeah. But we used it because we wanted that aspect ratio, which is closer to human vision. You can always see a lot more peripherally than you can up and down. So it's it's closer. It also gives a lot more lurking space, um, you know, where where something bad could be hiding. And if you use it properly, um, you know, how you compose a shot tells an audience where they're supposed to look. And if you compose a face in the middle, it seems okay. If you put it off to the side, you're saying, I wonder what's over there, you know. And how you, how you move the camera, um, is something that uh, directs the audience's attention. So it's not a haphazard kind of thing where we say, well, let's set up a camera and shoot a guy talking, you know, or a girl standing there. What is the intention of it? So, so we were able to thoughtfully do that. Um, plus, we also had the Steadicam, which 
um, at the time had just come out. Um, they'd been used for a couple of individual shots in, in movies, uh, Bound for Glory and stuff, for just like an epic moment. But uh, John and I said, well, what a great idea, because now you can move the camera smoothly in a way that the audience wasn't used to seeing. Handheld always had, you know, uh, artifacts to it. And um, <coughs> so we, we were able to m smoothly move the camera. So my camera operator, Ray Stella, and I went to Panavision, and we would try it on, and we would rehearse with it for two or three days, walking around the parking lot, walking through the offices and everything, trying to, to develop uh, a sense of how to do it. And, um, you know, so, and the opening shot um, of, the, of the movie was the most elaborate Steadicam shot that had been done at that, at that time. And, uh, and so when we realized that, it, it became a storytelling uh, element and a mood-producing element. I have a clip uh, from exactly the rehearsal that you were talking about that you did before, um, uh, before I started shooting the film, and I think you might recognize. Thank you. Um. Yeah, so that's uh, Krishna Rao, who was uh, just a, um, uh, I think he was an electrician or he was one of our camera loaders. Krishna Rao now shoots Hawaii Five-O, so you can see it's possible to, to, um, you know, get get somewhere uh, in spite of the fact that I hired him. But as you can see, we were we were practicing, um, and this is all on film, by the way. It was expensive, um, but we were practicing um, how to move with it, and it was it was for us an entirely new. Um, kind of experience. Now it would be even smoother than this, but um, l learning how to uh, to balance your weight and move and move the camera, um, it w it was quite a um, quite an interesting exper experiment. Here, as you rehearse, that's essentially what is an objective shot. It's like a description. Right. In the opening, we don't want to give out anything about the film, but the opening there will be a slightly different perspective, point of view, let's say. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we thought, well, we can use it to follow people. That's Ray Stella, the other operator in the yellow thing. Um, but we could use it to uh, follow people, but also to uh, be the point of view of uh, Michael Myers. So this kind of uh, movement and flexibility was, uh, oh, look at his old car. I remember that. Um, but this kind of movement was, um, you know, very, very unique at the time um, because to set up a dolly or, or do it handheld, there was a lot of time or a, a weird artifact of moving. Steadicam or Panaglide or? Well, this was the Panaglide, um, Panavision's um, copy of the Steadicam. I had used the Steadicam to practice a little before um, but uh, with this, um, Panavision uh, had made a copy and then later got sued and had to, you know, throw the parts away. And oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> Who was? I had so many. Yeah, that's uh, really quite amazing. <laughs> yeah, so this is Ray practicing with it with the only available subject. So, uh, just because we don't have time, because otherwise we would ask you so many questions about um, uh, the Halloween and the collaboration for jo with John Carpenter, but um, then you moved uh, to uh, a totally different type of cinema and director, which I'm talking about, uh, Robert Zemeckis, um, for which it probably was also because of the time period uh, and so many new things happening in the film industry, including, uh, and increasingly, you were increasingly working with an image that eventually would be um, uh, manipulated in post-production much more than the previous cinema. Did that have an impact in the way you worked, or like, uh, um, you want to tell us a little bit about how that um, type of cinema that you did? And by the way, by Zemeckis, I mean films like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Death Becomes Her, Romance in the Stone, The Three, um, uh, Back to the Future. So they're films that use quite heavily um, uh, post-production techniques to manipulate the image. Yeah, it, it was a, uh, an era where 
uh, visual effects were um, definitely becoming part of the storytelling. You know, it was becoming easier to use the blue screen um, than eventually green screen. Originally, blue screen. Uh, that as a just a little side bit of thing for your next trivia um, contest. Blue screen was chosen uh, because it was the color least uh, um, in the in human skin color, so they could make separations and and so forth. Um, was very carefully chosen. Now you can use almost any color, and so we use green screen for uh, electronic purposes. But um, Anyway, it was a period when um, you know there there were um, a, a lot more uh, there was a lot more ability to 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 do visual effects and to use it to enhance storytelling. So so um, I loved that idea that we could we could expand the visual storytelling um, with these uh, visual effects. So I always tried to stay up on whatever was the the latest, which is something I always recommend. Um, you know, it's it's easy to to get lost in in visual effects now because it, they're computer nerds that that do the work. Um, but it's important as a cinematographer, as a director, to understand the process so that you can uh, effectively, you know, make decisions. Was there any difference in this? Because it's in some ways, not narratively, but in, uh, visually in terms of special effects, it's very similar. But was there any difference that you, you felt when uh, comparing the work for Zemeckis and the work for Spielberg? Because you worked, as you mentioned before, in Jurassic Park and Hook. And uh, so was it, did you find any different approach or something that affected also your way of working? Well, I've, I've always thought of Stephen as sort of the, the consummate visual storyteller. I mean, he's invented so many um, things that have become sort of our shorthand of, of storytelling. Um, Zemeckis had worked um, with Stephen, um, you know, because uh, Stephen had produced um, a couple of films. And uh, so Bob was a student of, uh, of watching Stephen, as, as we all were. And um, so it, uh, um, I, I consider them the two best visual storytellers that I've worked with, uh, although John is also extremely good. But, um, um, you know, the, some of my, my most rewarding experiences were, were working with uh, Bob. And the very first film, um, uh, Romancing the Stone, it was a film that... Um, was kind of a, a comeback. Uh, uh, Stephen had uh, given him a chance with a, a couple of films, and they weren't big successes. Um, but uh, *Romancing the Stone* was a uh, was a really good script, which was extremely important. Um, had good performances, you know, with Kathleen Turner and and um, what's his name, uh, Kirk Kirk Douglas's son, yeah. or Michael yeah. Michael Douglas, yeah. Um, you know, so, um, and, and I, I really uh, enjoyed working with Bob because he was very responsive to uh, suggestions, um, enhancements. He would say, well, we need a shot that does this or that. And I would say, well, we could also do uh, that and this and, and, um, and end up with a, an, an enhanced shot. So I, I very much enjoyed uh, working on Romancing the Stone first because it was both of us just starting, um, but uh, then a lot of his other uh, projects were even bigger expansions on that storytelling. Was it difficult to work on uh, um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which you know, essentially part of the reality is not there, or just something that will be substituted later? Was it different for you? Um, Roger Rabbit was, for me, a great, great experience. I. I had been interested in animation ever since I was a kid. Uh, Twelve years old, became aware of the fact that these these guys were drawing these characters, uh, Mickey and Donald, but also Snow White and any number of things. So I became uh, intrigued with the process. I read everything I could. Um, you know, I collected animation art and so forth. 
And uh, so when Bob said we're, you know, um, going to make this movie about uh, animation in the wor real world, I said, oh, perfect, because I had already uh, all of the backstory about the process, you know. <clears throat> and uh, so um, it it became a case of uh, me being able to just further my knowledge by, um, you know, we we had been told by Disney that uh, this is. Here's the way, you know, because we've done Pete's Dragon and we did Mary Poppins and Song of the South. And you set up a wide shot. Don't move the camera. Let the animators move the characters around in the frame. We said, oh, well, how about if we wanted to pan with the... Oh, no, 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 no. Don't pan the camera. That won't work at all. Um, okay, and how about when they come out of light and shadow and so... No, 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 no. We can't... They paint the cells on the back, and they, they, that's the way they have to be. So light it, it flat. Uh, the, I think they, they didn't say flat. They, they said uh, completely, some, some euphemism. Yeah. And um, so uh, they gave us this whole list of things we could and couldn't. Don't touch anything in the real world. You can't, the ca characters can't pick up objects and stuff. OK. So as we left, uh, Bob and I said, OK, these are all the rules we're going to break. <laughs> and we found a, uh, an animator, Richard Williams, who was just crazy enough to go along with it. After the Disney animators and some of the really best Disney guys said, oh, no, 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 no. You lock off the camera and so forth. So <clears throat> we, uh, we went off on this journey of uh, we shot a test to prove that we could do it. Uh, it convinced Disney, and they said, oh, this is going to cost a lot more, but okay, go ahead. So um, we went off on the journey of creating, um, you know, sort of a new language of animation live action. Now, you know, again, it's, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, Roger Rabbit, that was one of those live action animation movies, like uh, every um, serial commercial we have now. But... Um, at the time, you know, it was once again the first. So, so we had a lot of fun inventing the um, the, the technology, inventing the um, procedures, the, all of that stuff. And and um, you know, I I consider it one of my favorite movies to have worked on. Even today, it's quite difficult to find something that matches that. I had a quick clip. Um, uh, because when you were talking about them, the fact that at first they told you not to use, uh, not to move, and all this, I said, well, actually, the film is filled of uh, characters picking objects and, and, and moving around. And so exactly. um, there was a clip that um, moved there. Um, where, uh, it's a chase sequence, essentially, and that's um, the one, this one here. You can just lower the lights a little bit. It's just a few. Oh, that was quick thinking, Eddie. That's my gift of the old spine flower. The wise the Roger! Yeah! That's you, sis! Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, get out of here! What are you waiting it's for? There's damn key! Hey, you wait! Let me out of here, will ya? Come on, I gotta make a living! Eddie, is that you? No, it's Eleanor Roosevelt. Come on, Roger! Get me out of here! They locked me up for driving on a sidewalk. Come on, Eddie, get in. It was just a couple of miles. I'll drive. But I want to drive. No, I'll drive. I'm the cat. Out of my way, pencil neck. How about this weather, huh? It never rains. They sprung the cab. Let's go. And how about those Brooklyn Dodgers? Are they bums or what? Come over, I'm driving. Company. That was an incredibly long chase sequence at this point. Then. Yeah, it was, with a lot of movement, a lot of things we, we weren't supposed to do, but we did them anyway. Um, but yeah, you'll notice that, I mean, there's even just subtle movements of the, uh, the uh, camera moving in or dropping down. Um, uh, uh, the rule w w that we ha made, um, Bob and I, that we followed, was the fact that if you were doing this as a live-action movie, 
how would you really shoot it? What would be the camera moves? Well, what would the characters do? Um, you know, for instance, all those papers, um, there's a cartoon car that went through there, but you accept it because when the papers um, move uh, and there's interaction, you say, oh, well, that, yeah, that's the stupid lever. Um, that uh, um, you would, um, you know, accept the characters in this world if there was interaction. So we always tried to create interaction, handling of props, moving of things. Um, and um, it's, so this this became uh, the, the rule of if it, they really existed, how would we shoot this? And um, how would, um, you know, the, the world around them be affected by them? Um, and I think it's one of those things that you, you know, at, at first, if you are an animation person, you look at it and say, oh my gosh, look at that, that's amazing. But after a while, you again get sucked into the story, um, and you just accept the fact that there, there's this rabbit and this human. And, and um, Bob Hoskins was brilliant at being able to mime, um, because he had worked, oddly enough, as a mime uh, early in his career. <coughs> and um, also to be able to see the rabbit. We tested. Uh, three or four different people, a couple of big names. Um, and it was a little short scene where they he spoke to the rabbit and handed some things or whatever. And n none of them could convince us that they saw the rabbit. It was, um, but Hoskins had a, a unique skill, and which is the crossover between the real world and the, and the cartoon world is having that human who convinces you that, you know, he could see, and therefore the real world existed. It's quite amazing because it actually goes back to what you were saying about like the film stars in front of a complete white screen where you you know there's nothing, and then you have this you know creative ability of like creating an entire world in front of you, and, and that's I think it's um, it's quite amazing. I guess it made your job a little easier probably working with him. Oh yeah, no, uh, Hoskins was really much a, a key to to doing it because he could he could visualize the rabbit. We would say he's going to do this or that. We had full-size uh, posable Roger um, that uh, out of rubber and we could rehearse with it. He could uh, watch the camera operator could could uh, see where uh, you know Roger was going to move. And we would shoot one rehearsal with the uh, the, the, the reference, the maquette. And um, that would go to the editors so they could, and the animators, so they could see what was the intention of the scene with the characters and stuff. But also it gave Bob a, a chance to visualize and see the rabbit. Did you, do you think there's a difference, in, did it affect you in one way or the other one, the switch from uh, film to uh, digital? Is this something that um, had an impact in the way you work? And well, um, I I haven't used film in quite a while, and I've gotten used to digital. Uh, early on, it was it was a clumsy uh, visual device. You know, the contrast was different, and um, and the manufacturers kept saying, "Well, we're we're working on it. It's almost as good as film." And uh, which is when I would say, "Well, why don't we just use film instead of you know being almost as good as?" Um, <clears throat> but um, there was that pressure on them to do it. So now, um, you know, some of the newest cameras, the, I use the, uh, the Alexa quite a bit. Um, some of the uh, newest cameras um, actually are, are very good for um, creating it. And, and it's a little different look, but you adapt to it and you change your contrast and your, your um, you know, imagery. Um, but... Uh, for the most part, you can uh, use it. Uh, you know, I always tell um, students and emerging guys and stuff that um, it's a tool. And um, it's a, a tool that's easy to obsess over, you know, because there are all kinds of statistics and data, you know, how many megapixels and 
was it, is it Rex 709 or is it whatever? And there's a whole bunch of stuff that's easy to learn compared to the idea of the visual storytelling aspect of it. So it's just a, a tool that is supposed to be used and you adapt a little bit to it. You know, so it's it's like a carpenter who obsesses over should I use this titanium hammer or should I use this steel one, but it's got a wooden handle. Wait a second, which one, you know, and you're gonna pound a nail. So so um you know, it's it's the same with the cameras. Don't don't worry so much about learning anything other than the visual storytelling, and then um, and and fortunately, I don't have to actually deal with the cameras. What plugs in where, what on the menu, you know, goes down to changing the color temperature or whatever. I have people for that, <laughs> and you, you have to hire smart people because otherwise you look stupid. So. Um, but, um, y you know, you, y you always have to remember that your job as the cinematographer, director of photography, is the storytelling. And the same as the, with the director. I know there are directors that I've worked with who obsess because it's easy to understand the technicalities of the camera as opposed to how should I actually use the camera. So, so it's, it's all about... How do you use the camera, not which one? I think that's an excellent advice for um, also all the students, the members of the community that are here that want to uh, make movies and get into, particularly into cinematography. Um, last question that I have for you is, uh, if you had to do it all over again, would be, um, again, uh, working in the movie business, would you, which other profession would you choose and beside, of course, uh, cinematography? If, if in film, um um, I would probably go into production design, although I'm intrigued by editing. Editing is a very key aspect of what we do. Everything we shoot goes to an editor, so you have to give them the right pieces. So um, as a cinematographer, you have to know as much about storytelling as an edit with, you know, with editing um, as the editors do and the directors do, because it's your guidance is what's going to... Um, produce uh, shots that will cut together, um, shots that tell exactly the story at the exact moment for the right length of time. Uh, you know, so, so you have to be as concerned about editing and you have to be able to edit the movie in your head, um, always see the movie in your mind. And um, you, you also have to, um, you know, you, you don't have to know how to use that computer because it, once again, it's a, is that the titanium hammer? Um, so <clears throat> you have to uh, understand the, the technique and the process um, as well as an editor does, uh, and then you just hope that you can supply all the right pieces for him. Well, thank you very much for coming and for staying and talking to us about your career. And uh, we'll have a Q&A uh, session after the film. Anything you want to say about Halloween just before we? Well, I, I, uh, you have to remember it is 40 years old. That's almost as old as I am. <laughs> what, are, what are you laughing at? <laughs> um, 40 years old. Uh, I just went to the um, 40th Halloween convention in, in Pasadena. Um, and it was amazing to see how many fans there are who are not 40, who uh, have seen the film, um, appreciate, uh, you know, appreciate it for what it what it is and what it did. Um, and and it's easy to look at it and again say, well, oh, it's another one of those horror films, another slasher movie. Well, we didn't use any blood; uh, it was all imaginary. Um, so you have to look at it with that in mind um, and remember that it was being made by people who um, were just starting out. We were inventing um, our own, you know, language of film, own dialect. Um, so uh, for that reason, you know, I've, I've always been uh, relatively proud of it, e even though it's, you know, 40 years old and and um, you know, quite um, 
quite primitive in some ways, but uh, at the same time, I feel pleased that it's still looked at as being semi-sophisticated, so. Well, thank you so much. Again, <laughs> Dean Candy. She's going to pass and give you the uh, microphone. Oh, gentleman in the rear there. Uh, hi, name's Eric. Uh, quick Hello. question. Uh, what do you say your signature shot is? Hmm, that's, uh, that's always tough to say uh, because uh, each, each shot is considered for each uh, the, the purpose, you know, the storytelling. So um, I think it's kind of hard to say I have a signature shot or in this film there's a signature shot. Um, people, people tend to remember uh, and ask about the, the shot where Laurie is, um, you know, uh, hiding uh, against the wall thinking she's safe and uh, Michael's face suddenly or slowly appears in the closet beside her. So that's one of the shots that was, um, I think, a little unique for this film. Um, obviously, the opening shot with the Steadicam uh, was also unusual. But, um, and, and a lot of it was, yeah, you have to remember that we had like 21 days to make this movie, um, which was not a lot of time, um, even by low, low budget uh, you know, uh, standards. So uh, we had to be very efficient uh, with, with all of the shots and with staging and everything. So um, there's, there's one shot that I remember um, where um, I think Annie has come, brought the, uh, uh, the kids over and uh, they're carving, she's carving a pumpkin, Lori is. And um, the two kids are going to into the living room to watch uh, TV. Well, it it seemed like a uh, a shot that I, I as I watch it I say oh how brilliantly conceived, except for the fact that the reason we shot it that way is the social worker came and said you're going to lose the kids in 15 minutes, <laughs> and we had to dream up some shot that would tell the story of bringing it over and. Uh, ben Tramer and uh, blah, 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 all the dialogue between uh, our two girls plus the kids in the background. So uh, John and I uh, invented this you know, staging that um, brought them in and a pan over to reveal Lori's in the kitchen carving the pumpkin um, and uh, she follows, uh, you know, Annie to the... Um, the doorway framed uh, with the kids in the background and the, the, the whole scene took place in one shot, um, which, you know, I, I, people have said, oh, well, how brilliant to do it in one shot. Well, it was necessity because the, uh, the social worker was breathing down our necks. And um, so uh, that's, it's the kind of uh, thing that I find challenging when setting up a shot or inventing one is how to fulfill the storytelling without, um, you know, ruining uh, the, the, you know, any of the integrity of what you're doing. So it's, um, th and I think that's probably one of the fun things I enjoy about what we, uh, we do in this business is trying to be efficient but effective in the storytelling. How involved uh, was uh, the producer, Mustafa Akkad, with you when you were working on the movie, and did you do the filming for all the sequels? Um, the, what was the last part? Did I? Did you do all the camera work for the sequel Halloween oh. movies? 
Um, well, the, the last part first, uh, I shot the Halloween 2 and then Halloween 3, um, which was not really a Halloween movie, much to the dismay of the audience. Um, they, uh, when they went to it, they said, but, but where's Michael Myers? <laughs> In, in that tone of voice, by the way. Um, so, um, but I did uh, Halloween 2 and then uh, 3, which was, you know, a completely different kind of film. Um, Bustafa Akkad, who, uh, you know, put up the, the money for it and, and was the producer, um, he, um, apparently what happened was John and Deborah went to him uh, because he said, I, I want to make a movie about the babysitters on Halloween night and they are being killed. And John said, oh, well, that's, that's a good premise. Um, how about if uh, the girls are... The girls, babysitters, Halloween night, being killed. See you around. And he... <laughs> Which was actually great because it gave us um, complete autonomy. Um, there was nobody watching, breathing down our necks, saying, wait a second, how come he can drive a car? You know, things like that. Um, so I, I think that that was, um, it w was a great uh, sort of incentive for us to do it properly because there was nobody watching us. Um, but uh, also, it it sort of tainted, um, you know, our perception of making movies because there was nobody there. We were autonomous. We could do whatever we wanted. Um, and so for the next film, The Fog and subsequent films, um, we were, you know, pretty much on our own just to how we wanted to tell the story and, and what we wanted to um, do with it. Um, until we got to The Thing, which was a major studio production. Uh, we shot it at Universal. And um, there was always somebody saying, you know, I think you also need a shot, or how come the uh, guy did this or that? So um, it was a um, case of um, being, um, you know, watched and, and uh, not having the autonomy that we did before, so it it became a sample of what it's like in the real world of making films. Um, hello. Uh, um, yeah, so I, I, was, I was just curious. I mean, you mentioned that uh, Deborah Hill had made your introduction with, um, I'm right up here, over, oh. with, with uh, John Carpenter. And, um, you know, clearly, like, uh, there's, you know, you have a relationship with certain directors and such. And I was somewhat curious how, like, the cinematographer is brought into a project. Is it usually by a relationship with a director, or kind of how does that, you know, the different modes of the, that the cinematographer gets attached to a project? Um, well, yeah, very often it's it's because it, it it is the director's um, incentive and and his doing that usually brings on a cinematographer. Um, they're, um, uh, you know, even even in the major studios, the, uh, they don't often interfere with that kind of relationship. Um, I, uh, I did hear that after I'd been at Universal for a little while doing Psycho 2 and something else, um, that um, the director wanted somebody in particular for one of the shows um, but the studio said, well, no, he's not that experienced. Um, and they said that I was approved. Um, but, but that's kind of a rarity. Um, most of the time it's the, um, the, the director's choice. Um, and a lot of times it's somebody they've worked with before. Um, for, uh, for instance, I didn't do the prequel to The Thing, um, even though I was offered up because the director had somebody he'd worked with. And, and that's an important relationship. I always respect that uh, concept um, because, uh, you know, my 
uh, a lot of the films I did uh, were because Bob Zemeckis asked for me again, Carpenter asked for me again, um, you know, and, and you develop, you know, the relationship and the shorthand of um, how you want to stage a scene or use the camera or whatever. I, um, I, you probably get asked this all the time, but I want to do what you do someday, and I hope to be as accomplished as you are someday. And I was wondering what advice you could give to someone who wants to get started in the cinematography business. Um, a very frequent question, um, and an important one. I, um, I, I usually mention a couple of things that um, are important. One, one is um, that y you, well in, the, in this business, a lot of it is relationships uh, with the director, as I just said, but also um, other, you know, networking and so forth. Um, so I, I advise a film student or a person beginning or somebody who wants to get into it, um, to take any job they can possibly get, you know, I, I'm, um, I, I'm always amused by the fact that um, you know I started in makeup because that was the job that was available. A lot of us, um, you know, will take uh, electrical jobs and and grip jobs and and uh, anything we can get, camera assisting. Um, production assisting, whatever, um, just so you get exposed. I, I remember with amusement uh, a fellow student of mine uh, that I uh, was with at, at uh, UCLA Film School, and um, he was, um, he, he always wore a sports coat, and he was, um, I wouldn't say arrogant, but uh, you know, he had a very nice opinion of himself. <coughs> and uh, one day he said, you know, we're graduating in a couple of weeks. I will do anything in this business. I'll produce, I'll write, I'll direct. <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, wait, there's an awful lot. What, a, what about sweeping the editing room floor for somebody? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. No, no, I, that's not what I do. Uh, I have no idea if he ever, ever did anything um, because of that, that, that sort of perception that, you know, you're, you're going to just get that great job and, and be discovered. So um, I always say take any job you can get. Student film, public service announcement, um, cheap low-budget movie, um, you know, decent size uh, movie, whatever it is. And uh, because w what happens is you gain experience with um, a lot of important stuff other than maybe the job you were hoping to do, cinematography, for instance. Um, and you can um, watch the protocols on the set. You understand chain of command. There's, th there's a very distinctive uh, sort of set of protocols on, on who's in charge of what and how you can make your ideas known and how you don't interfere with some, you know, it, it's a, an interesting, uh, interesting procedure. And um, so uh, taking any job you can get, you can network. You'll find uh, people that, uh, you know, y you had n no idea. I. I was doing a low-budget movie early on, probably about my third movie or so. And there was this production assistant who would come up, and he had kind of frizzy hair and and uh, seemed inquisitive. And he would bring me coffee. He would run over and get the thing or whatever. And every once in a while, he would say, you know, I noticed you, you put a light over th there. Um, well, well, what's that for? And I said to myself, oh, not a bad question. He deserves an answer. So I said, well, that's to light the, the guy when he comes out the thing and with the tree in the background. Oh, okay. 
And then he'd go away and he'd come back um, with another glass of water or something and say, you know, when you put the camera over there, it seems like, um, you know, that was really a good way to see uh, something. And I'd say, yeah, yeah, very, very perceptive. So he was just this kind of production assistant fellow. Except what I didn't know at the time was that he had written a script that was going to be written, uh, pr produced and directed by a friend of his. The movie was a go. He recommended me to the producer director and I got a job from just a little production assistant or seeming like a production assistant. So you never know um, where a, a contact will take you or, or whatever. Um, other advice is don't ever ask how much are they going to pay you. <laughs> because that immediately says you're in it for the money and not to create a great, great piece of art for whoever it is hiring you. So um, you just take it no matter what and hope that someday, you know, you'll you'll be able to say, oh, well, here's what you pay me. But in the meantime, getting started, you you just, uh, you know, do it because you seem to love it. Always give 110%. Um, you, you don't want to say, oh, well, it's been 10 hours and I'm tired. I'm go I have to go now or whatever. No, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do those extra shots on Saturday. I'm I'm washing my car or whatever. You just take the job and do 110%. And in that case, people will see you as a team player, uh, somebody who's interested in uh, the project and doing the best possible thing. So those are my three basic, uh, you know, philosophical uh, thoughts about getting started. The rest of it is just scrounging uh, work, uh, gathering uh, uh, together a reel or whatever it is that y uh, your particular job needs, um, and um, you know, being ready to show people what uh, you know what you can do when you when the opportunity uh, knocks. Hi, <coughs> Chris. What was the film? Sorry, what was the film that you got through the uh, little production assistant? Oh. The film that uh, from the production assistant uh, it was just a little musical, um, hanging on a star, um, and it's um, um, was was fun because it was the first musical I had done, and I was interested in musical. I I played in the band all through high school and college, so um, you know my musical background made it, it easy for me to to adapt to this this film, and it was. Um, just a, a very small film. It never really went anywhere because there was no really skilled cast. But um, you know, it it was one of those things that um, it was an opportunity to do something I hadn't done before. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm looking to get into the movie business as well. Screenwriter. And for the record, I'll sweep the floor, no problem. Um, but I have two questions. One as a um, when you're writing or you have scenes, does the cinematographer just get the, the screenplay and the blank script and then you start working with that? Or, you know, where does the collaborative process, you know, start per se with the storyboards? Um, and then the second one was your opinion on CGI. There's, you know, stories like Jurassic Park and Lord of the Rings where it's essential and it makes the story. But I was watching Steven Spielberg one time and he was saying he loves it because they can save time and money, they can make an ocean a little more blue, a sky a little bit more of a different color, or a lawn. And I was curious what your opinion on that process is. Um, well, answering that, the, la the last question first, um, the, the digital world has uh, really opened up quite a bit of creative control over all kinds of stuff. Um, now we we send the um, the final result after it's been edited the the digital negative if you will, um, and we we go to the DI process the digital um, intermediate, and we have a tremendous amount of control now that we didn't have with film over color, contrast, um, 
lightening, darkening sections of the frame, you know, essentially um, uh, dodging and burning as it was in the uh, old days of just film. Um, and uh, so it, it's become a, a major uh, creative tool. Um, before um, the, the digital world, anything you wanted on the screen had to be done in front of the lens because once it ca was caught on the film, you had very little control over the, the end result. Now you can do a huge, huge amount of work to, uh, to, to create the looks. You know, you can desaturate the color because it's a period film. You can enhance the color because the forest is supposed to be greener. You know, a lot of, a lot of things like that. Um, and um, so I, I, I think that that's a, um, an important thing. The, the other thing is that, um, you know, at, on the, at the end of a major um, CGI film, there's a huge credit roll, and they give all the compositors and all of those people credit, and you can say, okay, um, you know, a, a, a superhero movie, naturally, uh, they didn't really blow up the city of Los Angeles, that was all computer guys, so I can see why there's like half of the credits that run through for about four minutes are all of these guys who did the computer work. But what's interesting to me is you go to a romantic comedy, which has nothing special about it other than, you know, performances and stuff, and at the end of the credit roll, you'll see a list of also the CGI people and and um, you have to say, well, what, what did they do? There was no monsters. There was nothing. Well, they do, as you were saying, they, they made the sky bluer because it was an overcast day, and they put in a blue sky with white clouds. Uh, they removed the billboard because the advertisement conflicted with the producer's deals or whatever. So there's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done by... Um, these CGI people, and which is why I say it's it's important to understand the process. Um, the first part of it about uh, when do I get the script? Well, when they've finished with it, they hope. Um, although very often I will get a script, and then there'll be revisions and revisions and revisions. But it's the beginning of the visualizing process. Um, what's the story about? What's the style? What's the period, what are the characters like. Um, so you begin to visualize and then, then you go through the process of l looking at locations and comparing them to the script. Um, you know, so, so it's an ongoing process and preparation of uh, reading the script before anything has been done and then starting to see locations and, and how it all develops and, and your input then goes in at that point too. Uh, hi, Dean. Uh, I was wondering about during the production of the thing, did you have problems with the cameras shooting in Alaska and also in the refrigerated set down in Universal with the moisture in the air? Did the cameras malfunction at all, or did you guys have to take special precautions for them? Well, we, um, we knew we were going to be under very adverse conditions. We were up in uh, Stewart, British Columbia, on the Alaskan border, way up in the snowfields. Uh, we were in Juneau, Alaska, doing all the aerial stuff with the um, helicopters and stuff, and we were miles from anywhere. We, we it was a half-hour helicopter ride to a glacier research camp, um, so it was it was actually very interesting because it gave us um, right at the beginning when we that was the first stuff we shot um, a sense of what it was like to be isolated and living in a in a, a thing. So that. That really, I think, helped me and all of us to visualize what what the life in the Antarctic was was like. So um, we we knew we were going to be in the cold. So I had gone to uh, Panavision beforehand and said, "What do we do about freezing cold below zero? And uh, they said, "Well, we we clean the movement. We put in special low temperature grease and lubricant." 
and then you take this stuff with you so that the movements always keep moving and, and they don't freeze up. Um, and they installed heaters, so we would have a battery and we'd plug it into the camera to heat the uh, the film roll and also the, uh, you know, and it wasn't very hot, it was just enough to keep it uh, above zero. Um, we did find that uh, there was, you know, bizarre things like uh, when, uh, when we would be shooting outside and it would be below zero, um, everything would be, were work fine. We would take the camera inside um, to service it or whatever and of course it would uh, fog up and um, c condense um, inside the lenses also. So um, the, the camera crew eventually found out they couldn't have a warm room in which to work so they took out all the windows in the camera room and they were constantly in the cold. They were always in their parkas and everything w working, it wasn't uh, it wasn't easy, um, and I I felt really bad when I was in the uh, warm room uh, having a cup of coffee, looking uh, at them freezing out there. Maybe you believe that. <laughs> Hi, Dean. My name's Naomi. I was, first of all, I wanted to just commend you on the brilliant use of shadows in this movie. It's really amazing. I was curious about if you had some, any film noir people that inspired you with some of those shots. Also, I was impressed by the fact that the uh, window shots, you had no reflections of the camera equipment, if you had any tips about that. And the last thing was I was impressed by the gunshot smoke and the profile shot of the um, the doctor at the very end, and I'm curious how many times you had to shoot that to get it just right. Well, um, the uh, the first part, the light and shadow. Um, I, as I watched this, I, you know, sort of reviewed myself and said, "Oh, why did I ever do that? Um, oh, gee, that was pretty smart. I'm glad I did that. Um, you know, and and you always do that." Uh, but I, um, I, I watched this and I, I realized that my, my instinct was to be sure that you could see whatever was important um, and then create the impression of darkness. You know, and, and I'm, I'm always, um, uh, you know, kind of dubious about the fact that um, the characters are going through the cave or they're in the the uh, warehouse where they can't see anything, and yet the audience can see everything. You know, the cave is lit with, you know, light that's coming from somewhere. And you say, well, I if I can see it, how come the characters can't see it? So um, it, it's always a case of trying to create the impression that there is uh, so, so much darkness that uh, in certain areas you couldn't see and other areas you um, you can because there's light coming from windows or light sources or whatever. So it's to me that's a a, a very conscious kind of decision um, to to create enough light that uh, you're never straining to see the characters' faces if you need to um, or the action or whatever, and yet you could still um, create the impression of of darkness and, and having black shadows. And, and sometimes it's, uh, you know, a case of, of uh, you know, lighting the wall behind somebody so they're a silhouette and then they step into the light just as you're supposed to see them. So it's a very, very conscious, you know, we o use the old cliche, painting with light. Um, and I, I believe that, you know, you, you light areas that you want to see or to create the mood. Um, but uh, also keep it dark when it's supposed to be uh, spooky. Um, not seeing the camera is always uh, an interesting thing. The, the uh, production designer, the art director, a lot of times they love uh, mirrors and windows and things like that um, because they're you know, so artistic or cool. And we hate them um, <laughs> because uh, that makes it impossible to put light um, anywhere. Um, the one, one example is that 
on for in Jurassic Park, uh, the the uh, raptors in the kitchen scene where the their um, the kids are being chased by the raptors. Um, has has uh, anyone seen uh, Jurassic Park? <laughs> oh, okay, oh, good. Okay, so I can talk about it. Um, the um, production designer w wanted a, the kitchen to look brand new, and so he put brushed stainless steel on all of the refrigerators and the walls and the counters and, and everything. Well, brushed stainless is this peculiar stuff that because they scratch it, it, it is prismatic, so no, no matter where you put a light, there's a reflection. So it was a huge job um, to put the lights, lighting in certain areas, but then putting up big black cloths uh, just out of frame, um, you know, so it, while you watch the movie and it looks like you're seeing all the kitchen, um, very often just out of frame are, are big, you know, black um, shadow makers and, and, and hiders. So. Um, it's it's a very uh, tricky thing to to uh, juggle the the technology and the physics um, with the uh, artistry a lot of times. Um, first, I just want to say thank you uh, for taking your time out to come and talk to us. Mm, certainly. Um, so I was just curious, how much um, influence or say? did you have in uh, other aspects and parts of the film? Because it sounded like you guys kind of had some free range with this movie. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I kind of got spoiled um, with this movie. But um, also, I, I think the, the previous movies that I had done, it was the same thing. There's, there were, you know, it's a very small crew, uh, inexperienced people, um, you know, so you're all learning at the same time. Um, so I, uh, I was always trying something new, trying to experiment with stuff. Um, with uh, Halloween, um, all of that uh, experience that I'd had um, came into very good use because um, we were then able to take it the next step. And uh, one of the things I um, remember is uh, being able to contribute, uh, you know, because ev everybody sort of contributed. They all, uh, th they all had a vision, um, or John could translate the vision. So everybody knew how they were going to contribute their part. <coughs> Excuse me, my my Ebola acts up every now and then. Um, so. Um, you know, it, it was a case of, um, you know, everybody sort of seeing the film and, um, you know, being being part of it. And uh, so I was, um, again, we were all sort of spoiled by the fact that we could um, create this movie with uh, everybody sort of contributing to it without, you know, a lot of impressive oversight um, by the studio or producers. Hi, Mr. Gundy. Um, Hi. I saw uh, the newest Jurassic Park movie, and I knew you didn't have anything to do with that. Um, and actually, I, I could kind of tell because they use a lot of the same locations, and uh, a lot of people talk about feel for movies, and they're like, oh, it didn't feel the same as uh, the first Jurassic Park. And I, well, I thought a lot of that was your cinematography, actually, because, like I said, a lot of it is the same locations. And if it's just the lighting, is just there's something off about it. Um, do I wanted. Do you have anything to do with any of the sequels for Jurassic Park? No, not, not really. Not directly or personally. You know, I mean, I I think the the last two went back to the the first one yeah. as far as the feel and um, you know the the intent. Um, but um, no, they. I I like to think that I had influence because they watched the first one. Um, <laughs> But then I'm also disappointed, um, you know, that they weren't able to c carry it through completely, and and that gets noticed by the critics and and the crowd. Yeah, well, definitely, because uh, I mean, even before the dinosaurs break out in the first half, there's a whole feel. Um, this kind of like new. I don't know. It's hard to explain. But um, also, my second, my follow-up question was. Um, it's kind of a weird question, but did you ever go to? Um, 
Steven Spielberg's restaurant, Dive, on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard in uh, Century City? Uh, yeah, I've been there a couple of times. Um, but uh, And I can uh, recommend the, the uh, glass of water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I was, I was I heard they but had the, subs, but, but they're the kind of expensive. It, the rest of it, I don't know that much about. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, my question has to do with uh, the collaborative process between the director and the um, director of photography and um, like the art department. Have you, like you were talking about, when you get a script and you start visualizing. Have you ever had a time where um, what you envisioned completely contrasted with what the director had in mind or with the art department or that you couldn't decide on the lighting until you saw what the costumes were going to be like or the set was going to be like or something like that that changed in the process? Um, yeah, it's all, you know, as you say, it's a very collaborative process and, um, you know, they they hopefully they cast the actors to fit the characters and so that the audience you know buys into it um, the same with the um, all of the creative folks you know, hopefully they cast them um, because their perceptions about um, you know style um, w what they uh, bring to the script um, you know a lot of times the production meetings are are all about all the collaborative people sitting around sharing ideas and someone says, oh, that's good, you know, I hate that, you know, and uh, so it's a, um, it's a it's a process that, you know, I always intrigues me about a, a, a film that turns out well because all of those people got it. And, um, you know, then the, then there are the times when it, it doesn't happen, you know, and there, <coughs> There's, uh, I've worked a couple times with new directors who, um, you know, had had sort of a, a uh, bigger idea of their of their creative skills than you know because I worked with one who um, had only done one previous movie and it was a you know major film at Universal and I had been brought on to support and um, I remember fairly frequently but uh, certainly specifically one time when I uh, the director said okay so this is the scene the guy comes through the door he's going to go climb the stairs halfway and then he comes back and he comes into it okay um, and I said well let me think I think if we put the camera here what we can do is I I'll decide where the camera goes he said um, and he said, I, I, wanted, I want it on the floor. And I said, well, I'm not sure that that's... Uh, when I, I said, I want it on the floor. And I said, okay, let's put it there. So we put it down, and he looked through it, and he said, well, this isn't going to work. There's no ceiling in the uh, set in the background, um, and we can see all this stuff. And I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> he said... Well, and I said, well, wh how about if we put it, no, no, let's, let's put it over here. And then uh, he, we did that, we took all the time to set it up, and he looked and said, well, this isn't going to work, we can't see the guy come through the door. And I said, no, and so we went around to about four different setups, and eventually, of course, <laughs> <coughs> it ended up my first suggestion. Well. To me, that that's sort of the uh, you know the, the advantage of me having done so many films at, up to that point, um, and the director not understanding that, um, and not being able to listen to suggestions or ideas, um, and then evaluate them. You know, if he, um, I could have said, well, if we put it on the floor, no ceiling, and the, this and that, and you know, and he'd have said, okay, and you only sit, do the setup once. But he wasn't willing to listen. He had to assert his uh, authority. So um, it, it's an interesting process of um, learning that no matter how you know experienced you are, you always listen to the other people because they bring a perception 
or a point of view um, that can be very valuable in um, you know accomplishing what you need to do. Hi, Mr. Kendi. Um, I have a two-part Halloween question. Um, what's your fondest memory from the set when you were filming it? And the second part, what I always admire about the film, besides the fact that there isn't any gore, is that a lot of it takes place during the daytime. And I remember seeing it as a kid, and just the scenes where Michael would stand out from the ledge and go back in, or when he was standing in the clothesline, was extremely frightening to me, and how effective that was to have this just this mask in the daytime, and as, as a viewer, be so scared. Um, are you uh, in awe of the, the staying power that this movie has had 40 years later uh, when you were filming it? Did you know what an impact it would still have today? Yeah, you know, uh, here we are, like I said earlier, 40 years later, um, and it's still, um, I, I'll go to a meeting or a convention or something and people come up and say, oh yes, it's uh, my favorite uh, horror film or whatever knowing that there's been 40 years of other horror films. Um, so for them to, uh, you know, pick out Halloween um, as, as well as, you know, another six or eight uh, films that were well done, um, to me is always a, um, a great uh, deal of satisfaction um, to, to know that um, what we did uh, still holds up as far as creating mood, you know, I, I, I see all the rough edges. Um, you know, I like, I wish we had done this, or if we'd only had three more lights, I could have lit that tree back there. Uh, but, but um, you know, for the most part, um, it for, for a very first film from a bunch of, you know, relatively new people, um, you know, it. it it's fairly sophisticated, and, and it holds up uh, pretty well. Mr. Cundy? Um, I, I um, am still wondering, uh, there was a question earlier on who influenced you? Who did you have favorite cinematographer, camera folk, uh, either film noir or otherwise, that influenced you? Who let you in? Oh, <coughs> sorry, that's my very good friend Jeffrey back there. <laughs> I do my best to embarrass him. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a question that comes up uh, every now and then, which is uh, my influences and stuff. I don't know if I can say there was one uh, cinematographer, or one, you know, it's like saying one film that influenced you um, the most. Um, I and I, I think we all do, you know, good work, and then there's stuff that's not as good because the circumstances are, are not the same. You know, the, the story wasn't as good. The director didn't have a, a, a concept. You know, so um, I, I look at, um, you know, one of my early, um, you know, I guess, um, uh, cinematographers that uh, affected me was Conrad Hall. Um, he's, uh, you know, been gone for a while, but he, he did quite a number of, um, films that, um, you know, at, at the time I watched and said how clean, how, uh, effective, um, you know, and, and, uh, subdued. It wasn't, you know, really glitzy or, or, uh, you know, show-offy. And, and to me that's a, an important thing is that, um, my job is not to, create um, great art that uh, everyone looks at and knows that I did it. Um, it, it should be um, work that serves the film, um, that uh, people watch this great big white wall um, and are not aware of uh, anything. It's, it, you know, I'm, I'm a little leery of, um, you know, now, now there's, because of the digital cameras, it's possible to do um, all kinds of um, other other things and glitzy work and um, shooting in the dark so you can hardly ever see anybody and uh, you know creating a a style um, that you adhere to and 
Um, to me, that's like I shouldn't go into a movie and know who shot it. I should just be able to say, oh, that's really good or that tells the story. So um, I think, um, um, you know, it's, it, it's very hard to say any particular guys. It was, it's usually movies that uh, I look at because they're, they are the collaborative, um, you know, result. And when you're working on a, a set uh, and the talent in front of the camera to you isn't being authentic or isn't uh, working, um, do you tell them or do you have to give that feedback to the director? Um, there's actually, you know, an important chain of command that um, is just sort of understood. Um, I would never go and talk directly to an actor um, I can have a reaction. Uh, I can, uh, you know, suggest that they stand over here because the light's better on them or, or whatever, but um, I, I wouldn't ever really uh, try to comment on, on them, how they would play a character. However, I can go to the director <coughs> and say, you know, if I have enough confidence in our relationship, well, it seems like he's a little too harsh for whatever the scene is or something. And it's, yeah, I was thinking the same. And it, what it does is reinforces, you know, because the, the crew is the first audience for a movie. Um, they're there before the film is done. So they each have a, um, an opinion. And, and uh, sometimes I've had a grip come up and say, you know, it seems funny that uh, the guy does this or the story point or whatever, um, he would never, the grip would never go to the director. Um, he knows that, um, you know, I'm the guy that he can talk to about that. And I would say, yeah, that's a good point. Knowing that he's watching it and he's an audience member and he, that something doesn't ring true for him, um, then uh, maybe it's not going to be right for the audience. So you go then, I can then go to the director and say, um, you know, uh, I, it's, this seems like maybe he's a little too harsh or is, would he really say that or, you know, something like that. Um, but it has to be couched in, in terms that, um, you know, the, the director will listen to as a suggestion. Uh, and lastly, you, you um, I think you mentioned earlier that uh, you didn't use uh, storyboards for, for this film, for Halloween? Um, not, not too much. A lot of this film, a lot of Halloween, um, was sort of created as we went because we knew that uh, time was of the essence and, and um, you know, for all the various reasons that um, I mentioned earlier about having to consolidate shots and, and so forth. So it was a case of learning to think on our feet. Now there's a, there was a few uh, ideas for shots, but it wasn't storyboarded. And I've worked on other films where they storyboard the, the scenes exactly, um, which is um, a kind of a two-edged sword because um, I've worked on shows where they give the script to the storyboard artist, or in the case of some, like 10 artists. And those guys go off and they do the storyboards, but they're doing the storyboards for their movie, as opposed to one that is the director's, um, and or mine. And um, the, the, the style varies uh, from guy to guy. Some guys would rather be um, doing comic books, which are uh, static frames that jump and so forth. Um, other guys are very good at indicating uh, the camera pans to reveal and then dollies in and so forth. So there are different storyboard guys with different styles. Um, in this particular case, um, we, we didn't use storyboards because we um, knew we were going to have to make it up as we went. Um, other other times you can get very good storyboards and, and it helps everybody because they know what the shots are going to be and especially if there's visual effects or something uh, to be used.
Oh, I wanted to ask a question about um, Jurassic Park, about the visual effects of the first movie. From what I've heard, Spielberg used a lot of animatronics for the dinosaurs, and I was wondering how exactly the the post-production team decided to combine computer effects with practical effects or models? Um, good question, because um, the, the original concept of uh, the, the running and moving dinosaurs was going to be stop motion, um, a very uh, old technique, you know, with a miniature rubber dinosaur and you move it a frame and you click and you move it a little bit and you click a frame and when they're all run together it looks you know like they're moving but it it has funny artifacts um, and doesn't look as authentic um, so um, when we were prepping and w were in some of the initial uh, meetings uh, they were running some of those tests and and we all said mm, yeah they look okay um, and Dennis Murin who was at uh, ILM used to be around this neighborhood. Uh, it's now it's at the Presidio. Um, he said, you know, uh, we think we can do this all in the computer. Nobody had done that. And Stephen said, well, that's great. That's great. Well, let's see what you've got. And he said, well, um, we haven't done it yet, um, but um, wait here. So he came back two weeks later, and he had some very simple um, you know, tests of, of a T-Rex running. And each week he would bring an improvement. So we, we said, okay, we will um, buy into this. We'll dedicate ourselves to this new process nobody's ever done. Um, but we'd also, um, Stan Winston was building um, animatronic um, full-size uh, puppets heads, um, shoulders, um, you know, anything that wasn't a full-scale running creature. Um, and we mixed them up in the, uh, in the, the uh, dinosaur, the raptors in the kitchen scene with the kids. Um, about a third of what you see, or, or almost a half, are the rubber dinosaurs um, and the, mm, the CG ones um, or, you know, the, the rest of it. And I, I, I was absolutely amazed because we would light um, the, the scene, we would light the rubber dinosaur to um, look good. Um, <coughs> and then we would shoot that sh shot. But then we would rehearse with the rubber dinosaur knowing it wasn't going to, you know, work. We would shoot a shot um, with the rubber one, um, and um, the, th that became the reference for the CG guys for lighting, for texture, the skin, for reflections, for all all kinds of other stuff. So they did a a masterful job um, duplicating what the uh, rubber ones looked like. And uh, you know, it's it's you know, I I look at that movie and say you know how it holds up. You know, you can watch that movie and it isn't like it's jerky or um, the compositing is um, bad or the skins don't match or any of that stuff. You can watch that movie now and say, oh yeah, that looks like it was done, you know, last week or, or whatever. So it was, to, to me, it was a great, once again, the collaboration between um, <coughs> myself Stephen, um, the CG guys, Dennis Murin, um, all of that was was amazing, and you know it shows up uh, in the product now. Hi, I'm glad to see that uh, Jamie Lee Curtis is still attached to the Halloween movies some 40 years later. I was wondering how she got cast in the uh, in the first movie. 
how, how she got what? In cast. Oh. Um, I, I don't know other than the fact that John and Deborah had seen her in, um, you know, TV. I think she was in a TV series pre prior. Um, and they thought that uh, she had a great look and looked like, you know, the girl who could become the victim. Um, so it was, you know, it's sort of a fluke, you know, because the credit says, and introducing uh, Jamie Lee Curtis as, so uh, it was obviously her first um, credit of, of any, any consequence. And she um, just did a great job, as we, we can tell from the film. So we know that you have an early class tomorrow morning to teach. Um, Brian, where's Brian? Um, you might want to tell us, say something about that. Um, and if there are any students here from my Monday and Tuesday class, come and talk to me now. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, this is uh, Brian Antonson. I teach production here. I just wanted to thank Mr. Kundi for coming. Uh, we can give him a of you who uh, want more of this, uh, we're going to do a deeper dive maybe into some more of the specifics and technology and kind of anywhere else we want to go. But tomorrow morning we're going to be in the Santa Rosa campus in Bertolini on the first floor at 8.30, about 8.30 to 10.30, um, and that's open to anyone. You're, you're welcome to join us. Um, I'll also make a quick pitch. We have a um, thriving production community here. Uh, one bit of advice. Uh, Mr. Gundy shared today was uh, if you're interested in film, make it. Um, we've got a, uh, an amazing community here of, of filmmakers, and if you are interested in that, um, every semester on both campuses there's a production, fiction production class, and it's called Media 20. So the spring semester is up. I think it posted yesterday. So if you're interested in that, uh, check it out. It's called Media 20, and it's Introduction to Digital Filmmaking. You know, if. Oh. Good, I'm back on. Um, as a um, as an addendum to to that concept, um, when I started, uh, the films I did, you know, the girls in bikinis with machine guns um, and something blows up films, um, they were made for the drive-in theater. Back in the days when we actually had drive-in theaters, and um, the th the theaters needed product. They needed films to run, and they were willing to accept a lot of low-budget films that the m major studios didn't make. And and um, you know, so um, I had an opportunity uh, of entry-level stuff with these, you know, film films that were basically uh, a way of learning. And uh, then the business went into a cycle where drive-in theaters disappeared, and the uh, studios began making these B-movies, except they made them as A-movies and spent a lot more money on them. And my opportunities, uh, I, it just coincided with Halloween and a few other uh, movies after that where the studio was interested in my participation. Um, if I had been at a slightly different time period, like earlier, um, there's a good chance I wouldn't have been able to get into this this business. Um, you know, I'd have been working for a long time as a camera assistant or something. Um, well, now we've come back into a new cycle. There are those opportunities for you to make a film and have it seen. You know, YouTube, um, Netflix has something like a hundred and some million um, contributors, uh, subscribers, um, each of, of them paying ten dollars a month. So if you say a hundred, say a hundred million times ten is ten hundred million. That's whatever it is, um, <laughs> and um, they need product, and the drive-in theaters now is your living room, because uh, Netflix. You know, you sit and watch your, your TV. Same with Hulu, same with Amazon, all of these things. So they are anxious for product. 
um, if you can um, do something that attracts their attention, uh, either as a, uh, a small complete film or, or a lot of people are making sizzle reels and, and trailers and so forth like that to uh, attract the attention. Um, sometimes these, uh, you know, if, if you show it on YouTube and it makes a big hit, um, the, the opportunities are there now for um, the exposure uh, for, for your product. So um, it's a good time to be uh, an interested filmmaker, but of course you have to be a good one also. All right, well, thank you so much. We really appreciate having you here.